All right, everybody, we are here to answer that burning question that everybody has in every single one of our videos. Should you go with an all-in-one liquid cooler or with an air cooler? Now, this video, it's actually going to be pretty straightforward. What we're going to do is we're going to take the best of the best air coolers that we've tested. We've tested 24 of them up to this point. Actually, there might be a couple more than that. And we're going to put them up against the best 240 millimeter all-in-one liquid coolers that we've tested. Now, I know everybody's gonna be yelling at their screen right now. It's not a really valid comparison because we're not looking at the larger all-in-one liquid coolers. But there's a reason why I chose the 240 millimeter AIOs other than the fact that they're the only ones that we've tested up to this point. It's simply the fact that the pricing right now for the 240 millimeter AIOs at least some of the best of the best, is very comparable to some of the best air coolers out there too. So what are the competitors? Now, the first thing you need to take into account is that the best on AMD platforms are not necessarily the best on the Intel platforms. So on the Intel side, we have the Corsair A115 and Noctua D15, along with the ultra well-priced Thermalrite Phantom Spirit. Those are up against the Thermalrite Frozen Edge as the budget pick, along with the Fantex T30 and EK Nucleus. On AM5, there's the Noctua D15, with its offset kit installed, Thermalrite's Peerless Assassin and Phantom Spirit, alongside the Arctic Liquid Freezer 3, Deepcool LT520 and Fantex T30. Now, with the tens of thousands of lines of data that we have from previous videos, we should naturally be able to put this one together relatively simple, but it's not as simple as that, unfortunately. You see, in order to work as efficiently as possible and to get as many results across a wide range of air and water cooling reviews, we actually use two separate systems, both with 13900Ks. Normally you'd think that two identical CPUs would be pretty close in performance, thermals, and power, right? Well, no, since even a slight sample-to-sample -sample variance has pretty big impacts on our results. Putting the Phantom Spirit on both systems shows the 13900K on the air cooler test bench runs a bit hotter, and despite that, it also hits marginally higher sustained frequencies. In order to get the results you see in this video, however, we're actually using the AIO test system to normalize everything out. As for AMD, we actually use the same CPUs for the air and all-in-one liquid cooler results, so those can be carried forward. So I guess that sets the stage, and the first thing I wanted to get to is the AMD results, because those ones are actually the most straightforward here. Let's start with gaming and put all the liquid coolers into this chart, the best of which is the Arctic Liquid Freezer 3, at lower noise levels at least, while the LT520 really picks things up as its RPM levels increase. And the air coolers, well, they're all ultra competitive, with the Peerless Assassin actually beating the T30 and eventually matching the Deepcool AIO. And the D15, well, that just creams everything. And if we look at these against all the AIOs that I've tested, well, the D15 can dominate, but you also have to remember it costs between 110 and 120 US dollars these days. That makes it more expensive than the Liquid Freezer 3 and LT520. Meanwhile, nothing, and I mean nothing, beats the price to performance ratio of the two Thermalrite air coolers here. What really matters in gaming though, that's frame rates, and even with the hot running 7700X, every single solution here gets identical numbers, within a margin of error, of course. So air cooling or AIOs, it doesn't matter. You can be guaranteed the exact same frame rates with all of these coolers. Moving on to the 7600X, and here all three air coolers end up beating even the best of the best 240 millimeter AIOs on the market. The only exception here is a liquid freezer three, but with less than three degrees at most separating all six results, it's evident the 7600X isn't putting out enough heat to stress any of these coolers. Every single one of them would be an amazing option. The only way a higher end air cooler or AIO has problems here is if there's something seriously wrong with its mount, which is why NZXT and Corsair get such terrible results. But as we move upwards in the spectrum and heat goes up, the gap actually doesn't increase by all that much. The Peerless Assassin is still competing against the T30 AIO, while the Phantom Spirit and D15 end up matching the Freezer 3, which is pretty darn impressive if you ask me. All things considered, if you buy a really good air cooler, it will manage to run right with the highest performance AIOs on most AM5 systems, even if they cost less than 50 bucks like the Phantom Spirit and Peerless Assassin do. But again, we're only seeing a few degrees of separation here. Even on a 7950X, one of the hottest running 
running CPUs on the planet right now, there's at most about three degrees separating every single one of these options. It doesn't matter if it's the insane T30 or the super affordable Phantom Spirit. They all get within spitting distance of one another. And when lined up against all the other AIOs, the three air coolers do really, really well. But I have to put that into perspective because not a single option here gets the CPU below 90 degrees. And that of course has a direct effect on the clock speeds because the frequency delta between the absolute best and worst result here is just 68 megahertz, with the air coolers all taking up a middle ground between those two points. So on AMD, what we're seeing is very much parity between the best air coolers and the best AIOs, actually every single AIO that we've tested so far. The reason for this is not necessarily that one cooler is better than another. There's a serious bottleneck going on here, and that is the AMD IHS. The new Tower 300, definitely a unique looking case with a three-piece panoramic front view, made specifically for micro ATX motherboards with insane hardware support, like a 420mm rad fits on the side of the enclosure with this easily removable fan bracket. My 4-slot GPU fits in no problem with breathing room all around, fully dust protected on all sides too, the optional LCD screen is super fun, and the lay flat mode <laughs> brings the Tower 300 into a whole new universe. Definitely explore the color options too, all linked below. So before all of you air cooling fans like me start screaming from the rooftops that your solution is superior, we have to check out the Intel results because those, those flip this whole situation right onto its freaking head. Let's start with gaming and put the T30, Frozen Edge and Nucleus right here. All of them are below 70 degrees. Based on our AMD results, you'd think that our best ever air coolers on LGA 1700 would go where? Here? Maybe here? Well, actually, no, they ended up right over here. Nowhere near as competitive as they were with the AM5 system, with the closest being the A115, about four degrees behind the frozen edge and losing by almost nine degrees to the T30. But remember, we're only comparing the best of the best here. So when we add in all the rest of the AIOs and normalize the 38 decibels, things don't look quite as bad for the top tier air coolers. The A115 is ironically able to match Corsair's own much more expensive Link H100 i while the phantom spirit and d15 also compete pretty well with the h100i and tough liquid ultra and maybe the d30 as well but does that even matter absolutely not because while there might be such a huge temperature gap between the best and the worst they all get exactly the same frame rates so if you're gaming on your system i'd personally save some money and buy one of our recommended air coolers over an aio and maybe spend that extra money on a better gpu Moving on to an all-core workload and the three air coolers are still trailing behind by a much, much smaller amount. Simply put, a 180 watt processor doesn't produce enough heat to stress high-end air or liquid cooling. I mean, sure, there's still a six degree gap between the D15 and T30, but everything else is within about three degrees of one another. So yeah, air cooling is super competitive here, provided you get the right product. Moving upwards to 253 watts, and this is where the raw thermal dissipation mass of liquid coolers can really come into play. All three traditional heat sinks struggle to get below 90 degrees until they get a bit further into their noise range, while the AIOs can stay quiet and deliver far superior results. It's pretty simple. You need a hefty cooler if you're running a high-end Intel chip with a full core workload and want to keep it below 90 degrees. But if we put this into context, the Phantom Spirit A115 and D15 aren't entirely out of the running against some of the highest regarded 240 millimeter AIOs out there. Just remember, a lot of the latest high-end air coolers tend to cost more than AIOs like the Frozen Edge LT520 and Freezer 3. Of course, there's some exceptions like a bunch of the thermal right products, you really need to take those into account here because from price to performance ratio, they're still almost unbeatable. The bigger thing we actually need to discuss here isn't necessarily temperatures, it's performance. Because when it comes to Intel chips or even AMD ones for that matter, running at relatively high temperatures, clock speed is the absolute king. And in that respect, the gap between the air coolers and AIOs is at the very most 60 megahertz. Let me say that again only 60 megahertz. That's it. Basically what this shows is Intel's chip will boost to its maximum allowable speed within any power envelope provided it stays below its T-junction of 100 degrees. Go 
at that or above that, and that's where you're going to see some cutbacks. So temperatures, they actually don't matter as much as you might think they do these days. I've actually shown that in a bunch of videos up to this point. And speaking of 100 degrees, without the CPU's limits enforced, well, you're going to need a beast of a 240 millimeter AIO or a much larger liquid cooler if there's any hope of running under that 100 degree mark. So the air coolers don't have any hope here. Since it's pretty obvious, they're getting a bit overwhelmed. While the clock speed gap was minimal at 253 watts, even the best of the best air coolers are pretty far behind here, to the tune of 100 to even 300 megahertz in some cases. So with air cooling, there's some loss of top end frequencies. It's nothing extreme, but if you're paying for a high end CPU and hitting it with multi-core work loads, it should be running at peak performance. And that's simply unachievable with an air cooler, regardless of how fast its fan spin. So has that eternal question been answered? When it comes to price to performance today, should you be picking an air cooler or an all-in-one liquid cooler? And, and for me, I'm going to be very transparent here, I am an air cooling fanboy. I just love the simplicity of these things. The one thing that can go wrong, the fans can easily be replaced. On the other hand, there's so many things that can go wrong with an all-in-one liquid cooler. Yes, they can get some incredible results, but you have to remember, repairability and sustainability in the long run could be working against AIOs. Unfortunately though, until some kind of novel technology comes along, air cooling has largely hit a performance plateau, which is good because affordable coolers can get really, really good. Thermal right is absolute proof of that, but getting above that ceiling when it comes to performance is going to take a titanic effort. Meanwhile, if you avoid things like LCD and gobs of RGB, getting access to top tier AIO performance doesn't cost as much as it once did either. I mean, look at the Liquid Freezer 3, LT520 and Thermal right Frozen Edge. For less than $100, they all offer an incredible amount of cooling capacity. This simply shows that a higher price rarely equals better performance. You're simply paying for bling when it comes to AIOs. In the end though, there's no one size fits all solution. There are great air coolers that will perform just as well, if not better than crappy AIOs. Conversely, there are some budget AIOs that can dominate the best heat sinks out there. It all comes down to whether you want better cooling performance in some situations while potentially sacrificing reliability and repairability. And if your system is used primarily for gaming, you can use any of our air cooling recommendations or any of our AIO recommendations and you're going to be perfectly fine because gaming doesn't care as much for CPU temperatures as you think it might. So anyways, I'm Mike with Hardware Canucks. I hope you enjoyed the sort of like roundup content. If you want to see more of it, please let me know in the comments below and I'm going to see you in the next one. Have a great day, guys.